All right, folks, thanks for joining us. This is Josh Jacobs at the Leaders for Global Operations Program. Today's webinar is with Heath Holtz, who's LGO class of 2005. Heath is the Vice President for Supply Chain Management Europe for Nissan Motor Manufacturing, and he's the head of Nissan's team that's responsible for all the supply chain activities within Europe and Russia. And as a seven-year Nissan veteran, Holtz uh, has risen through supply chain exec roles at Nissan North America, at Nissan Motors in Japan, and now at Nissan UK. And Heath has also been the sponsor of two LGO internships that were offered by Nissan North America, uh, and in fact was, was part of the group that hired one of the LGOs that is just graduating this spring. Um, we're really excited to have Heath today because he's going to be talking about not just Nissan, but the way that Nissan represents uh, the opportunities and challenges for uh, a U.S. person to rise within the ranks of an internationally headquartered company. Um, just based on his own history, you can see uh, his very experiences first uh, as a captain in the U.S. Air Force and an OR graduate of the U.S. Air Force Academy. He also holds a uh, master's in OR from Georgia Tech and before coming to LGO was uh, a manager at Dell. Um, the way we're going to work it is uh, typically we just go through the presentation and then invite comments afterwards. Heath said that he is comfortable to take your questions along the way. So if you do have a question you'd like to raise, uh, go ahead and, and pop it to me or you can just chat to me within the dialogue, but please do stay on mute if you're not talking. So with that, thanks again, Heath, and, and let's start. Okay. Thanks, Josh. Um, First of all, I just want to apologize for having to reschedule this 30 minutes, but uh, fortunately we did, as my plane just arrived about 30 minutes ago, so uh, I was just able to make it here on time. Um, I've prepared a few slides. I'll, I'll try to walk through, and as Josh said, if there's any types of questions or if you feel free to interrupt me along the way. Um, in terms of agenda, I just want to give a little, little more background in terms of um, my general introduction. I'll talk a little bit about Nissan, some of the direction, and I think it's highly critical to understand Nissan as a company, our executive structure, of uh, kind of the the mindsets and actions in terms of how we operate, um, in, in terms of understanding specifically what's enabled me to be successful uh, and within Nissan, and then also general learnings that you can cascade or take across other companies as well. And of course, I'll be open for questions at the end as well. Uh, just a general background, I think Josh covered most of these. Uh, I am an Air Force Academy graduate. Uh, upon graduating from the Air Force Academy, I spent six years in the Air Force. I was a strategic planning analyst or a weapon systems analyst uh, for a few years. And then I went on to the Air Force Academy as actually an instructor in the math department. Um, and, and actually taught probability and statistics, all those courses we loved at LGO. Um, after that, I, joined, I went to LGO as kind of a break from the military life to try to get a career uh, jump into, um, com into the industrial life. Um, and after, after that, I, upon graduating from LGO, I actually went to Dell. So my first company out of LGO was at Dell, and I was a materials manager. Um, I was only at Dell for about a year. Um, Nissan at that time had relocated within North, Nissan North America. They had relocated their sales and marketing headquarters to Tennessee and was actually trying to consolidate all their operations. So at that point in time, it looked like a really good opportunity. And uh, I, I left Dell in Tennessee to join Nissan. Um, within Nissan, so I joined Nissan in March of 2006. I actually started in sales and marketing in, in a, an area that's vehicle operations. So this, this area was responsible for working with the sales and marketing staff and also working with the manufacturing organization to try to do the sales and operation planning activity, uh, take the forecasts, work with the plants, and try to optimize overall profit. And then also we were responsible for taking the central sales vehicles and then allocating those to the regions and in terms of establishing the policies that allocated those to the dealers. So ultimately we were looking, it was a very big picture role and I, I enjoyed it quite a bit. Um, after spending about a year and a half in sales and marketing, uh, I, I took a role within the plant. So I moved to the Smyrna Manufacturing Facility and was responsible for material handling. Uh, this was a, man, a large man management role. I had 
about 40 indirect staff. Um, direct staff, Nissan was around 300, and then I had temporary staff that fluctuated up to about 700 temporary staff. So I went from the sales and marketing organization with one or two people on my team to this uh, very large team uh, within the plant. So um, it was a great experience. I did that only for about a year and a half as well. After working in the manufacturing, uh, I moved into logistics purchasing and had responsible for setting up all the contracts and managing the contracts and cost reduction activities and tasks for U.S., Mexico, and Canada. Uh, this involved all of our service parts operations, uh, setting up the 3PL contracts to run our facilities, as well as all our logistics contracts with uh, rail providers, truck providers, um, and also some of the packaging uh, purchases that we did. After that, I was promoted into a role responsible for then the operations and the logistics within North America. So having set up all the contracts, I then had to deal with uh, the ramifications of all those contracts that I had previously negotiated. Uh, and I did that role for two and a half years. Um, at that point, I was requested and asked if I'd like to take an international assignment. And I went on international assignment to Japan uh, into a role called Deputy General Manager responsible for global logistics engineering and strategy. So this was mainly a project role. Um, I had a, a global staff, um, a, a number of different nationalities, and we basically set up all the new model contracts in terms of understanding how much the logistics cost would be and feeding those to the program directors to determine whether or not we could make the model profitable how profitable and how we could optimize the sourcing to, to help improve the overall profitability of the model. Um, at this point, we had a number of uh, management changes at the executive ranks, and it pulled through quite a few different people throughout the globe. And I was only in Japan for less than a year, and the position for vice president of supply chain management in Europe had opened up, um, and I got requested very quickly to move my family after moving to Japan uh, to, to move to Europe. So as of April 1 of last year, uh, I've been responsible for uh, the supply chain activities in Europe. And with the Nissan Europe, that also includes Russia. So um, it's a fairly large scope uh, in terms of the, the territory in which we cover. Um, we have about three to, depending upon the month, we have about three to four percent market share within Nissan Europe. Um, so we're still trying to grow uh, our footprint and grow, grow our sales. Okay, uh, in terms of just some quick facts about Nissan. So jo Josh covered some some of the information, but um, we are based in Yokohama, Japan. We removed our headquarters about five years ago from from Tokyo into Yokohama. Uh, our net sales is about um, 100. 100 billion U.S. dollars, and we sell about 5,000 units or 5 million units a year. And global production is relatively the same. We do have some OEM agreements where we're purchasing from other providers and then selling them. In terms of global locations, uh, we're fairly well represented throughout the globe, uh, with numerous R&D sites. Uh, specifically within the U.S., we have two R&D sites. Um, we have four production facilities. Um, with, within the U.S., um, what they're considering, we have one in Canton, we have three in Tennessee, separate battery plants, a, a powertrain facility, and a vehicle plant. Um, we also, within Europe, we have responsibility for facilities in Spain, uh, the U.K., and within St. Petersburg, uh, Russia. Of course, I couldn't go through any type of presentation without just giving a little bit of our product information, some of the exciting products that we have. So these are some of the newer models and some of the high, uh, large volume models that we have within within the U.S. So we have the Ultima and the Rogue. The Rogue was just launched with, uh, I believe, around October. So I've been out of the U.S. for a couple years now, but I believe it was about October timeline. We launched a fairly similar model in December here within Europe uh, called the Kashkai. Uh, they've both been very, very successful in the market. In terms of our a premium brand, we have the Infinity brand. Um, still trying to gain some traction within within uh, the U.S., also within Europe. 
Um, but our model lineup across our sedans and coupes and also our crossovers and SUVs. Specifically within the U.S., uh, we manufacture the, the QX60, which some of you may know as the, the JX, um, but that's, that's produced in our Myrna manufacturing facility. We've also introduced a new concept uh, for a sedan, a Q30, which will be built in the U.K. factory here uh, at the factory where I actually sit um, and have some responsibility for. Uh, I thought it would be important just to provide a little bit of an overview of how we're organized at, at the top in terms of our, uh, our company. Um, so many of you have probably heard of, of Carlos Ghosn. So Mr. Ghosn took over for Nissan about 1999 as a part of the Nissan revival um, and was very successful in terms of resurrecting Nissan from near bankruptcy. So he has a lot of books, a lot of background about Mr. Ghosn. Um, Recently, we've done a restructure uh, in terms of our organization. And so in, our, in terms of our C-level officers, they're not the typical C-levels that you would hear outside of uh, Joe Peters' position, which is a CFO. We have three, diff three other C-level officers in terms of a chief competitive off officer. And this person, uh, Cy Kawasan, is responsible for manufacturing, supply chain, R&D, purchase, and what we call um, total customer satisfaction, so the quality quality arm of our organization. Uh, he's basically the de facto number two in terms of our organization. We have a chief performance officer, um, Trevor Mann, uh, who's responsible for the overall regional performance, and I'll cover the regional organization here in the next slide just to provide who are the chairman for each of our regions. Uh, he also is responsible for the Dotson brand, which we just launched. Uh, relaunched, um, our light commercial vehicles, and also our after sales. And if uh, finally we have a planning officer or a chief planning office or chief planning officer, and this is Andy Palmer, and Andy's responsible for product planning and sales and marketing overall, and then also has responsibility for zero emission vehicles and our um, battery and battery strategy. As you know, with the LEAF, we've launched um, and are leading in terms of a zero emission vehicle sales. Um, regional structure, we have, we've recently reorganized into six regions. So previously we were three, and in order to try to focus a little bit more attention and try to improve specifically in some of our overseas markets, uh, we've reorganized to have six regions. So we have a European uh, Management Committee, uh, and this is the responsibility of Paul Wilcox, Hatasan was a previous GM or a GE employee who went to one of our suppliers in a subsidiary called Jackco and then recently joined Nissan to take over the uh, Africa, Middle East, and India region. Uh, Jun Seki is responsible for China, and then we have uh, Katagiri Sun, who's responsible for Asia. Jose Munoz is recently appointed for North America, and then Latin America is Jose Valls. The reason I went through each of these individuals and our executives and our chairman, you, you'll notice that we're a Japanese company. Um, in terms of our leadership, uh, it's very diverse, um, multiple nationalities, and even our chief, uh, our, our chief planning officer, our chief uh, performance officer, chief competitive officer, and chief financial officer and CEO. There's only one Japanese that's represented in the top four in the company. In terms of how we operate and some of the things that uh, we are supposed to manage in, on, on a day-to-day -day basis, we utilize the, the Nissan way, um, focusing on mind, certain mindsets that we should have and, and actions that we should take. Um, so in terms of performance reviews at the end of each year, uh, we measure what we do and then how we do it. Uh, what, of course, is just your objectives and how you accomplish your objectives, but in terms of how, we utilize this Nissan way to help uh, assess our abilities and assess the people that are working for us um, and ensuring that they instill the mindsets and actions that we want all of Nissan employees to, to have. Um, some of the mindsets that we have in terms of cross-functional and cross-cultural, I've already shared some of the organization structure and the people that are represented and all the different nationalities that are represented. 
we find it very valuable to to embrace uh, all the different cultures and utilize that as a strength in the company and also being very cross-functional to not work in silos. Um, the organization itself needs to be very transparent, uh, learner, frugality in terms of trying to get the most out of as little as we can do without jeopardizing, of course, uh, quality, cost, or delivery. Um, in terms of competitiveness, we want to be very competitive in terms of how we, uh, how we operate. Uh, in terms of actions, motivating your staff, uh, having your own motivation, um, making sure that we, we meet on our commitments and our targets, um, and, and so on and so forth. So I'm not going to go through those in detail, but this is just the general uh, mindsets and action that we try to instill throughout, and then we also rate our employees and, in, and ensure that our employees are, are doing this uh, on a daily basis. Um, in terms of when I first talked to, to Josh about doing this, he, he thought it would be interesting um, given the fact that I'm Air Force in, the back, in my background. I went to, to Dell and then joined Nissan and have progressed through Nissan um, and, and then been in all the different and been in three different regions within Nissan. He was trying, he wanted to better understand, he thought it would be useful to share what were the success factors for working in a non US. Uh, based company. Um, I just tried to list down a few and I would like a little bit of dialogue or some questions on this, but these are just my thoughts. Um, these are looking back on what I think made me successful in Nissan up to this point, um, but I, well, I also believe uh, that it, it, you can take these into other organizations that aren't necessarily a U.S. centric or U.S. based company. The first one is fit, and I think it's highly important that there's a good fit in the organization um, and also understanding what the company values. So Nissan values the diversity at all levels of the organization. There's, oper there's no glass ceiling in terms of your nationality, your functional experience, or your background. Um, you can see through, through the previous slides that there's a number of different people that have come from outside the company. Um, and there's also people that are from the UK. We have uh, people that were in Spain that are now in the US uh, responsible for the operation. So different nationalities that have progressed through the, through the company. And the next one I had is called uh, cross-cultural. And I, the, the key point for me is to res uh, respect and also in, embrace some of the cultural norms and differences. So I know when I moved from, I, I'd worked with the Japanese quite a bit for six years, of course, being based, uh, working for Nissan and being based in the U.S. But moving to Japan and living in Japan, um, one of the things was to completely immerse yourself in the culture. Um, that helped to gain a lot of credibility with, with the staff. It, it also made you much more successful in, um, in the operations and your day-to-day -day job because you understood and respected why decisions um, were made when they were made, uh, those types of things that you wouldn't have done if you tried if you didn't necessarily embrace the culture and really uh, immerse yourself into the culture. Uh, the third point I listed is attitude. Um, I think being humble, listening first, but also being a, a learner, where you're constantly trying to gather as much information as you can. Um, listening to the feedback from the people that you work with or the people that are on your team um, and trying to suck up as much as not knowledge as possible uh, has, has really helped me along the way in terms of the organization. Um, I've been able to get a much broader view of the organization by talking to a number of people and trying to learn as much about it as possible. But it's also made me much more effective in my role because I could reference uh, information that I've gathered from other people as well. Um, the fourth one I listed is flexibility, um, willing to try new areas. Um, though my career path has been primarily within supply chain, I, I did start in sales and marketing. Um, I jumped out of from them. I started in the military, went to a computer in Dell, and then joined an automotive company. Um, 
So I was willing to try, I'm always willing to try new areas, even if it's a, a bit uncomfortable at first. But also I was, you have to be very mobile and flexible. Um, and sometimes you're, you, you need to make sure that your family can accommodate as well. Um, I have two small children and, um, and my wife has been more than flexible uh, in terms of moving. Um, uh, my daughter is three, we're th when we first moved, three and five, and we moved from the U.S. to Japan. In the middle of their school year, we up and we moved here to the to the U.K. And it, so it's not just me being flexible and mobile, it's also your family and does your family uh, situation allow you to be. Um, so it's, I think that's one of the key points is you got to be open for when the opportunities come up and be flexible, be able to adapt, uh, and especially in a global company like Nissan, um, the opportunities aren't necessarily always in the States. It, they're going to be elsewhere, and if you want to progress through the company, you got to be willing to take, take a jump when the opportunity presents itself. Uh, the next one I had was results, and... I, I think one of the most important things to, is that uh, success in your roles generates more opportunities than any type of network that you have. Um, gathering the credibility of your staff and the credibility of people you work with based upon how well you perform is much more important than having a champion that um, is in HR or a champion in another function um, because people ask the questions, people ask around you, and your reputation will, will carry you a long ways in terms of your overall performance. Um, and, and that really helps in terms of moving from region to region is because people could reference the results and what you've done in your functions previously. And the last one, and we can't, uh, this, is, this is a large portion of it as well, which is luck. You have to have the right people um, who are in a hiring position but you also need to be in the right place at the right time. Um, so when this position opened up here in, in Europe, um, it, it just so happened that the person that I had known who I worked with in the U.S. was also over here in Europe, and and he was the one who helped pull me uh, pull me along as well and gave me the opportunity. So it's a little bit of the you know the right the right people there at, at the time, um, again, the right place and, and, and the right time in terms of where you're at and where, whether you're flexible and whether you can move. So the, the next thing I wanted to talk a little bit about as well was to was go through LGO, what impact it's had on my, my career. Um, the, the first thing, it was my first real global exposure. Um, I, I hadn't traveled much uh, when, I, when I was growing up. I hadn't spent a lot of time in the Air Force outside of the States. Um, so throughout my career, I had very little exposure outside of the U.S. And I think my first real global exposure was, was at LGO, um, both in terms of the fac faculty, in terms of the students, and also in terms of some of the companies that we've got to meet. And, and people that we got to talk to. Uh, the next thing was the educational experience, and it's the balance of engineering and, be, uh, and business is extremely valued in global manufacturing companies. Um, so some, a lot of the, the people have been very successful in Nissan have a, a true appreciation for the business side, but also have some functional expertise in terms of the manufacturing experience or engineering background and experience. Um, one of the other things with LGO was just the overall network. So just a personal network that I still talk to some of my, um, some of the classmates in the LGO just for, just to check in of course in terms of a personal relationship. But if you ever have any career advice or ever need a sounding board, uh, those people in your classmates, most of them know what situation you're in. They, they give you very sound advice, and, and it's a great network that you have. And also the professional network. In terms of uh, when I was at Dell and even considering moving toward, uh, very quickly moving into Nissan, uh, I used the LGO network to help make the initial contacts. 
Uh, in terms of access to resources and what I've carried since, I, since I've been there, uh, the internships, Josh mentioned that we sponsor two internships, and both of them were very, very successful in terms of what they delivered. So it was a great resource to have uh, in terms of generating some results um, within the organization. So Liz was there when I was um, when I was in the role, and she generated you know millions of millions of dollars in savings and some of the recommendations that she made. I know JS was there after I had departed on to Japan, but we initially started the internship, and I know she's done very well uh, there, and will join Nissan. In terms of also having access to the faculty or, or utilizing these webinars for, for topics as well. And then for me, the last thing in terms of LGO, it was indeed a career springboard for me. Uh, having spent six years in, in the military, it wasn't very, uh, it wasn't always an easy transition to go over into the civilian world. Um, so this was one of the ways to kind of get the exposure um, get the experience through an extended internship and also start to develop a network that was outside of the military. Um, so it was a great springboard for me. And, and I put this little note down at the bottom just as a reminder. For, for LGO, I think you, you're, you only get in or you only get out as much as you put in. And quite frankly, I don't think that I've used the resources and the contacts enough. We've done, I've done some internships, like I've said, um, but there's numerous other things that we can get involved in, um, but I just haven't made the time. So unfortunately, I don't think I've gotten out of it as much as what I could, but it all, it all depends upon me um, and the fact that I just haven't made as much of an effort at a, as I really would like. Um, so having said that, these, this is the only information I've prepared. Uh, I just wanted to kind of walk through a little bit of the background, give you some discussions in terms of the company, um, just some general thoughts in terms of my career progression and what's made me, I, I, if you want to say, successful in, in Nissan, and then also the impact in terms of LGO. Um, so right now I'm open to any types of questions. Thanks so much. Um, we're going to just start with some of the folks here in the room at LGO. Hey, Heath, thanks for, uh, thanks for joining us. I had a question you had mentioned. Uh, yeah, sure, I'm Paul Meggs. I'm a LGO 14. Uh, I was curious about your transition. You had mentioned that you were in sales and marketing, managing, I think, one or two people, and then you transitioned to managing a much larger group of people. And I think that's probably a transition that a lot of us will have to make, you know, sometime in the next few years. I was just curious if you could talk a little about, you know, what made you successful in that transition, uh, you know, if you could point to one or two key things that you did, uh, and, you know, what did you learn from it? I, it's a great question. It was of all the roles that I've had, I would say that's the most influential in terms of my career. I think people management, um, and especially large teams, the sooner that you can get that experience, the more valuable it is to your career. In terms of um, specific things that I can point to, the first thing is uh, learn to learn to trust your team and depend upon your team. And then be a resource, and then try to be a resource to to eliminate the blockers and let them um, utilize their ideas. Uh, I had a team that I moved in when I moved in. I was actually younger than um, the son of two of the employees who worked for me. Uh, so I was twenty twenty nine at the time. Um, let's see. That's, Let's see. At, I'm sorry. I was 30 at the time, and he had a son that was 32, and uh, the other one had a daughter that was 31. Um, but anyway, I, I realized that they had loads of experience. Um, most of them had been there at least 15 years. Um, some of them had been there close to 25 years. And I could see that they had a lot of good ideas, and the one thing that they really needed the most was to be able to implement the ideas and have someone be the supporter. The person that I replaced was more of a dictator. Um, so the first, by listening and understanding the organization and then being an enabler for the ideas that they wanted to implement uh, made a world of difference. And once we started gaining, I gained a little bit of credibility within the first few months, um, then the sky was the limit. The team was really good. They were behind the direction that, um, that I was going and the changes that I wanted to make, they were supporters instead of people that were blocking them. 
Hopefully that answers great. your question. Yeah, that's great. Thanks. Uh, thanks for doing this, Heath. Uh, this is Ryan Jacobs. I'm an LGO 2015. Uh, my question is about the progression you see going forward being an international company. Uh, do you see a continued need to take international roles and continue moving around, or do you see an ability to, I guess, come back to the States or locate permanently in Japan? Um, what would that trajectory look like going forward? It's a great question. Um, I was asked by our head of global head of HR, um, I guess it's been about five years ago, and he said, "What type? Of, there's one of th there's three different types of leaders, and you tell me which one you are." He said, "Are you a regional leader? Are you a regional leader who wants global experience? Or are you a global leader?" And at that time, I told him um, that I was a regional leader that wanted global experience because I'm willing to do that job, and once I go global and I see how I adapt and how my family adapts, I'll determine whether I can move into that third third category for global. Um, and I think now it's, I've proven that I'm interested in being a global leader and move because I've moved from the U.S. to Japan and now to Europe. Um, specifically, the opportunities, uh, there's a lot of discussion about returning back to the U.S. I think there's um, potentially roles within the U.S., but um, with Nissan, if you continue to progress, you'll ultimately end up in a position with, within Japan, uh, maybe not necessarily long term, but you'll at least spend one or two more uh, assignments in Japan. And also now with the increased um, involvement with our alliance with, and the convergence with Renault, there's also additional opportunities that have opened up within Paris. So uh, I see some opportunities in the U.S some opportunities in Japan, and now some opportunities also in Paris. It's not a direct answer to your question. Um, uh, we don't necessarily know what's going to happen, but I think in terms of where my career path is at and the opportunities that I'm, uh, I could challenge for, those are those are the locations I potentially could go. Okay, thank you. Quick, quick follow-up. Was international experience something you were looking at when you joined Nissan? I know you're in Tennessee. Were you looking to gain that international experience, or was that like a you know something that evolved over time? Uh, it, it definitely evolved over time. Uh, my wife, if I would have told her eight years ago, um, I'm going to leave. We're going to leave Dell. We're going to join Nissan, and we're going to have to go live in Japan. She would have said absolutely not. Uh, she did not want to move, and she would not wanted to move abroad. Uh, so it wasn't something um, that I intentionally joined. Or intentionally wanted to do. It's just after I got into the company and started the experience and working with all the different cultures, I it intrigued me, um, and it, it's been a great experience. Thanks. Hi, Eve. This is that. Uh, this is Gold speaking. I'm an LGO 14, and I guess this conversation uh, I follow up to Ryan's question, which is, um, you've worked now for uh, an American company and a Japanese company. Your international experience, do you think that was precipitated, that was a sort of requirement because you were working for a foreign company um, and therefore the international experience was more valued? Or had you stayed with an American company, would you have been more inclined to stay within, closer to headquarters, I guess? Um, I haven't thought of that, so I'm going to... I, for Nissan now, uh, they are requesting that people in vice president roles or above have some level of, when I say requiring, it's not mandated, but they, it's suggested, I guess, to get some level of international experience. Um, I think to be successful in a global company, having worked in another region and understanding how another region, uh, other regions are to help benchmark across the regions, makes you much more successful, and I think it's a very valued experience. Um, is it, It's not 100% required. If I was in a U.S.-based company, um, I think it just depends upon the industry and where the growth, where the growth is occurring. Uh, I can't imagine um, <coughs> working for an automotive company even in 
the, the states, the domestic automotive companies, without having some experience working in another region because a lot of the growth areas outside of the U.S., the industry volume in, in automotive has been relatively stagnant for years, and the growth and the profitability growth of a company is, is in emerging markets and being in different markets. So I think it's, it's for certain industries, it's definitely required to get that type of experience. Thank you. Whether, yeah, whether or not I, I would have done that, I guess it just depends upon what industry I would have ended up in. Thank you. Hi, this is Albert, um, LGO 2015, and I had a, a really quick question about where you are in terms of your role and where you are in life. Is there anything that it keeps you up at night now? Um, actually, I have to say yes. Um, there, there's, uh, to be honest, there, there's, a, there comes a point where you start to struggle a little bit with your work-life balance and what, what becomes, com what becomes comfortable for you. Um, my scope is, is, is quite large, and I do a lot of traveling. So I travel almost every week to one of my, uh, one of the facilities, um, in the within Europe or within Russia. So the the role itself is quite large, and there's a number of different issues that can occur within supply chain at any point in time. So whether it's a, a natural disaster or a supplier issue or those types of things. So I think you I – don't, I don't go to sleep every night um, and wake – and wake up really concerned what's going on, but there's a lot of things that are currently on, on my mind. Um, so I, I think you also need to start to understand specifically what you want to do with your career and, and trying to maintain a healthy balance to keep, you know, with your family, but also with uh, uh, interest outside of work. Um, so I know I'm dancing around your question quite a bit, um, but yeah, there's, uh, there, there are a few things, um, but I, I, I think in terms of trusting your team, trusting the operations, and understanding specifically what your role is in terms of short-term activities and long-term activities is, is the biggest thing, and that's just something you adapt as you as you progress through uh, through your career and you progress into larger roles that have more scope and, and more impact on the business. Great, thank you. Hey, yeah, Albert, I know I didn't answer your question. I apologize. <laughs> no, that was good. I see we have a few LGO folks on the call. Aaron, Steve, Mike, I don't know if you want to chime in. Uh, just one uh, quick question. Um, <clears throat> uh, just how would you, I guess, you know, you've worked at kind of a high tech company and now an automobile company. I'd uh, love to just hear kind of culturally, you know, what you see is similar and what's different, and just your thoughts on that. I had a little difficulty hearing the question, but I think I understood it as high-tech versus uh, an automotive industry and the differences between the two in the culture. Is that correct? Hey, Steve Cook. Yes. Hi, hi, Steve. Hey, good to see you. Um, I think the focus on results is the focus on the results no different. The the differences between between Dell and then going to Nissan, um, the focus on delivering on a monthly basis, a quarterly basis, an annual basis are the are the same. Uh, I think in terms of the product development cycle, which dictates a lot of the momentum and dictates uh, a lot of the cadence in terms of the activities that we do on a planning basis is is much different. Um, we launch new models typically every six years in terms of re, uh, on a major model change and minor change every couple of years. So there are, there's a lot of planning and activity that goes into ensuring that when we do launch a model and we spend millions of euros in terms of level investment that we launch it correctly, the supply base is completely in line to make sure that we don't uh, have any types of di disruptions when, when the model launch. I think that's the biggest difference in terms of how quickly adapt, but that's just based on the fact that the product cycles are different. Hi, 
I just wanted to ask you, um, uh, as you're sort of reflecting back on, on uh, time at LGO, are there are there specific classes or courses that you wish you had taken um, that would have been helpful for you in sort of your uh, in your career? Right now, I wish I would have taken a little bit more mechanical engineering. <laughs> Believe it or not, um, I spent a lot of time with suppliers and um, looking at the quality up and skill up of some of our suppliers and understand their mechanical processes when we have uh, um, quality rejects and failures. So a better understanding on mechanical engineering would be much better, but I know that's nothing I can learn in one particular course. Um, I think the key courses were on the business side were finance, uh, understand the fi and finance and accounting. Those are the critical skills that were very beneficial in terms of running a, a, a team where, um, such as the material handling team I referred to, or uh, in terms of the operations we're dealing with now and managing the free cash. Well, I know that Don would endorse that last statement, wishing that you'd taken more engineering. Um, yeah, it's typically not the response when we get asked these questions. Or when I remember asking these questions, that's not what most people said. But I wish I had a little bit more engineering. <laughs> it's what I'm thinking now. Hey, Heath, this is JS. Um, thank you for the kind words about my internship. I feel like people in the room have been looking at me to ask a question. So um, one thing I'm curious about is you said you're going to be judged by your results, not by your network. And so it seems to me like when you first get into a company, you want to really make your first few years like very successful. So then you gain this reputation of you do achieve results. And I was wondering if you have any advice um, beyond just like working really hard to get that reputation. Well, I think you find find product, uh, side projects or additional work that you can do um, where you can help and support uh, other people. I think your your day job, of course, um, you wouldn't be at LGO if you didn't have the ability, the skills, or even the recommendations that you would deliver results. Uh, if you can find additional activities um, and where specifically you're maybe supporting someone else um, and, and identify where you can add value and demonstrate the results, I think that's a that's a great way to do it. I know, you, JS, you know from within Nissan we have the cross-functional teams. Uh, one of the items I remember working on almost immediately after I joined was a, a specific cross-functional team project, and we were working on dealer deliveries and did a lot of analysis. I utilized a lot of OR techniques and presented information related to dealer delivery performance and activities we could do to improve it. And it was something that actually got presented all the way up to the CEO. Um, so it was just a great project. It was a great opportunity I was able to get involved in, um, but it was outside of my day job. All right, well, um, I think we've had a great conversation, and I just want to thank you, Heath, for taking the time, uh, particularly after a long day and a long week, for sharing your experiences with us. Um, I think we, we all learned a lot from this insight into uh, one LTO's experience. Um, so uh, just for those of you on the call, this, this, uh, this call will be archived and up on the LGO website pretty soon, and you can share it with others who might not have been able to join. And again, thanks so much, Heath, and we look forward to our next discussion with you. All right. Thank you.